can't believe all these people who got up this morning to come to this talk. <laughs> oh boy, no pressure there. <laughs> um, yeah, so thanks for coming out. It's really good to see all of you. Um, some familiar faces, some grounding faces, a lot of new faces. Um, and I hope something that I say about process will speak to you. Uh, okay, so I think I'm gonna open with a poem. I know I am. Gonna open with a poem from Hemming the Water. Really? Damn, okay. Is that better? Can you hear me? Okay, all right, cool. Just. Yeah, do that whole Pittsburgh shout out louder thing, uh, and I'll speak up. Okay, so I'm going to open with a poem from Hemming the Water. The Antelope as Document. One, if I am the dove and you are the wind, together we have some business. Two, Maybe I'm a little half chick, one of the lost ones on the way to Capital City, thinking along the journey. I'm whole, and the king will be so pleased to see me. Three, erase the deities of ocean and sky. Four, if you want to be touched, say, touch me. If you want to be held, say, hold me. Five, an antelope running wild on the plains of Africa should not be considered a document. Six, the girl's green t-shirt reads, save Darfur. Such a message, how shall we classify? in the context of a day without rain, or in the neighborhood the girl walks, in the borders of her country strapped and declaring war. Seven, object, document, star in sky, no, photo of star, yes, animal in wild, no, Animal in zoo, yes. Eight, coffin draped in flag, no. Photo of coffin draped in flag, yes. Nine, eventually wisdom arrives, but men spill their milk in the meantime. 10, who will offer his tongue? So I noticed, uh, um, I guess in the past couple of years, I get invited to talk a little bit more about process. And I guess that forces me to think about it a little bit more, write about it a little bit more. And I, I mean, I know intuitively that in my process, things move around a lot. It can be a little bit skittery, jumping from idea to idea. So I think that's embedded a little bit in this talk. It made a lot of sense before I went to bed last night. So <laughs> we will see how it goes. OK, so I'll open with this story. Um, and I should also say these, <laughs> these slides, thank you for being so accommodating about the slides. I don't know how much they're really related. They're mostly like placeholders. Um, but anyway, OK, so a student stopped by my office recently to talk about a new writing project, his new writing project. Um, it was difficult for him to classify, but it was politically and culturally engaged and filled with a lot of things known to make Americans uncomfortable. There was racism, classism, upward mobility, teenage rites of passage, violence, posing, the, the whole nine. And um, so sitting across from me, he seemed to carry this whole writing project that's not even near finished in his whole body. 
Um, he was like touching his fingers to his chin, shifting left and right in his chair, looking directly at me and looking away from me. He seemed physically affected by whatever memories and incidents were moving through his mind as he shared his ideas about character and scene. He admittedly struggled with the overall difficulties of writing his story. Um, he seemed most troubled by the role, his role, as the narrator of a really disturbing period in his life about who pays what for speaking, as Audre Lorde wrote in her really brilliant poem, Cole. What right did he have to tell his story and what would be the costs? How would people receive it? So I'm gonna read that poem too because I will never pass up an opportunity to read an Audre Lorde poem. It's one of my favorite poems and she's one of my favorite writers. Um, okay, so I is the total black being spoken from the earth's inside. There are many kinds of open. How a diamond comes into a knot of flame. How a sound comes into a word colored by who pays what for speaking. Some words are open like a diamond on glass windows, singing out within the crash of passing sun then there are words like stapled wagers in a perforated book, buy and sign and tear apart and come whatever wills all chances, the stub remains, an ill-pulled tooth with a ragged edge. Some words live in my throat, breeding like adders. Others know sun, seeking like gypsies over my tongue to explode through my lips like young sparrows bursting from shell. Some words bedevil me. Love is a word, another kind of open. As a diamond comes into a knot of flame, I am black because I come from the earth's inside. Take my word for jewel in your open light. Thinking about today's social media climate and fast-paced news, imagining my student's trepidation when he came to talk to me was pretty easy. As introverted as I am, and as someone on the low-key periphery of all the media posts accumulating each day, I can still recognize the peculiar patterns of likes, mishaps, and battles that take place in comment threads about links and posts both friends and strangers may or may not have actually even read. As a writer of poetry, nonfiction, and most recently comic books, I'm always kicking myself for being so late to the digital conversation. How do other people get there so quickly? I don't know how y'all do that. <laughs> um, my social media presence can hardly be called a presence at all. Maybe for the first time in my life, as I get older, I'm facing the generational transition or changing of the guard and truly missing out on something. Um, though I do want to contextualize that by saying, like, in fairness to my generational cohort, who are way savvier social media outlet people, that maybe it's more about personal disposition. And I think probably that's true. So while others appear to be bobbing and weaving and snapping and chatting and God knows what else, <laughs> I'm walking around memeless as my email, I'm serious, as my email messages and notifications pile up and my apps go unupdated, the little white numbered red balloons, like the numbers just go up and up, 60, 65. 70, I mean really, that's what's on my phone. <clears throat> At least once a week, I'm, fill, I'm filled with like <clears throat> the temporary dread that I missed a key email or I didn't reply to a key email and that's gonna get me in big trouble at work or with some online stranger, somebody trying to reach me. Um, but for some reason, my digital habits don't change 
and do I have a problem? Maybe it's less of a problem and more of a fear. Is it a fear of being misrepresented, misspeaking, or having my words or myself misread? Though that seems like on some level, my younger self, my younger self's problem, a problem not totally accurate for my adult self, but still relevant. Um, in this moment, I feel more stubborn, a little cranky even, and less willing to participate. The time it takes to craft a post or to sit in a parked car at the grocery store staring at a smartphone screen because maybe too much time has gone by since so-and-so posted such and such and I really should like it soon. <laughs> and I have done that and I've seen other women in the parking lot like sitting there too. Um, and that's the time that I struggle with giving away. I'd rather use that time for writing a poem, which is one of the best ways I know how to make sense of the world. So <laughs> when Nathan and I met in person about this talk not that long ago, Nathan mentioned that I'd previously jumped at the chance to unpack the word context. And at that time, I was probably thinking about a physical self, my physical body in various places, and how that physical self might be read particularly in Pittsburgh, because Pittsburgh has been my home now for roughly 16 years. Of course, how others perceive me is beyond my control and kind of beneath my interest to control, and one can't fully control such a thing anyway. But when strangers treat us with disdain or suspicion, their false perceptions and who we are actually find themselves at odds. We don't know what exactly they perceive, but it's something. And you get, you know, these weird comments or questions like, you know, how are you involved in this? Somebody might ask, or why are you here? And their bodies might suggest that type of question, taking up all the sidewalk space, all the common spaces. And according to their ignorance, your body is out of context. But what does that mean, say, in neighborhoods once home to one population and now trending to another? It's a little bit irritating. And I usually meet these instances with a kind of cool contempt and refusal. And I don't know, I think there's a question, there's a pushback in there that's probably, I'm realizing now as I say this out loud that I need to unpack, <laughs> uh, maybe that'll come up later. Um, so what about writing? If you search essay tutorials or writing labs on the internet, you'll no doubt find tutors advising young writers to move away from what by now is a very old fashioned and overused approach, providing the dictionary definition of a word in the introductory paragraph. As someone, oh, see, look at that. My Aubrey Lord's image is all late. I'm so gone from that moment. <laughs> so bad at this. <laughs> oh, God, writers and visuals. OK, all right. But there she is. That's so good. I really need to see her up there. That's good. OK, that's good timing. Uh, good accidental timing. Um, so as someone who's graded hundreds of papers, of course, I know um, the resistance. There's not much creativity in opening a paper with a dictionary definition, and I'm sure like high school students have kind of done that to death. But as an introverted person who reads and hears more words than she speaks, I often use the dictionary to give me a kind of orientation or grounding. And I think that's really true for friends too. I like, I mean, I see, Taryn A out there. I see really cool people who I just like defer to and ask them a lot of things. You get a lot of information from them. So um, 
I like reading the definitions of words and even, even words that are used or heard over and over again, like context, like words that you are sure you know and understand well. Um, and even now, much to the chagrin of my teenagers, um, I'll ask them like what such and such in this song or that YouTube video means, you know, really, really needing their help and a kind of connection to maybe a different generation's language, a, another kind of youthful, youthful language. And um, I'm not really seeking coolness. I mean, that's a total lost cause. <laughs> I'm seeking the meanings of the words, of course, but also where the words come from and who uses them and at what age and in what moment, particularly at a time when I feel disconnected from people who are not my children or not in my handful of closest friends. So even if a dictionary definition intro is tired, I wonder if I can honor the personal gesture of looking, of investigation, of taking a moment for the self to gather a few words together, define them, get to know them, even if that gathering is not overtly or publicly documented. Maybe it's a way, like a ritual, some kind of practice to orient the self before diving in. So maybe it is cheating or in poor taste to get halfway through a talk and then revisit the definition, um, but I'm gonna do it anyway. <laughs> Context is, of course, what you already imagine, what your phone or search engine will tell you pretty quickly. That one, it's the parts of a written or spoken statement that precede or follow a specific word or passage, usually it, influencing its meaning or effect. Two, the set of circumstances or facts that surround a particular event, situation, etc. And then it has like a more biological, connotation um, where you get out and you start like connecting it to mushrooms apparently the little fibrous body of the pileus in the mushrooms okay so and then <laughs> let me see that's interesting I didn't really know that going in okay and then there's this part about middle English origins a jo uh, joining together a scheme a structure to join by weaving and that's the part that really floats my boat that part about weaving especially I love because it's so inherent to my writing process and somewhat lacking from not just social media, maybe just the uncurated internet blob overall, maybe. Um, unlike a fabric where, you know, when a fabric is woven, lots of threads and colors are patterned together and they make this whole, I don't know if it's a manageable thing, but thing, unified thing, more unified thing. So um, I guess on some level, social media is at least curated. There are people out there presenting their public selves, delighting the masses or irritating the masses. They link and they reference items from the less managed internet at large and maybe make us feel like we know them or like they are in the know or cultured or whatever image that they're trying to cultivate. Uh, I think actually this slide is gonna sync up maybe. So this week, oh yeah, there it is. Um, the digital world kind of spilled over into my hermitage. <laughs> and I kept hearing, I mean, first of all, that photograph alone is probably talk about that. I don't have an art background, so I'm not gonna even go there, but you visual arts people could probably. So that's the photograph that accompanied this story that was published in the New Yorker called Cat Person. And so I kept getting these little pushes from places or people, even on the radio, about this story that apparently was trending and being shared a lot. Um, and so I, just for background, I have subscribed to the New Yorker for a really long time. I can't even tell you why or how that got started. I think maybe, okay, whatever, it doesn't matter. <laughs> um, and so, it, interestingly, I hardly ever read the poetry 
in the New Yorker. In fact, I don't really read it at all. <laughs> but I always read the stories. I don't even, I mean, I'm not a fiction writer, right? So, but, and sometimes it takes me a long time. So, uh, you know, I'll tuck the magazine in my purse or in my backpack or in these little baskets I have all around the house. And, I'll, you know, several months can go by before I even get to an issue or finish it. And this time I had grabbed the issue with cat person in it, but that title, I mean, come on, that <laughs> that did not impress me at all. I don't know, just, I, and not even, that's not a diss to the story. The story is actually a good story. Um, but I'm allergic to cats. I'm definitely not a cat person. I mean, just, I didn't, there was no, I didn't feel any pressure to read it. But then this whole social media pushing thing, whatever, started happening, so, I kept thinking, well, I need to hurry up and read it because I don't really want to hear I don't, everything else that people are saying about it. Let me just dive in and see if it's uh, <laughs> any goods or whatever. I don't know. I just needed to know why was it trending? What was the big deal? So I went digging around for my copy and, you know, have you read this? Have you followed this? Okay. Oh, so some people are like, nope. So I'm like, okay, cool. That's why. And some people are like, okay, great. So it is a really fascinating story. I think you should read that story and then we can go out and talk about it. I, like, <clears throat> I don't want to give the story away, but I will like show you that's the woman who wrote it. And I thought, Eureka, okay, this is perfect. Like this is totally syncing up with that talk I'm gonna do on Friday. So the story, this is her, you know, the story was inspired by a small but nasty encounter. I had with the person I met online. I was shocked by the way this person treated me and then immediately surprised by my own shock. How had I decided that this was someone I could trust? The incident got me thinking about the strange and flimsy evidence we use to judge the context less people we meet outside our existing social networks, whether online or off. Um, and I loved, I feel like the story kind of summed up or touched a kind of nagging dissatisfaction I'd been feeling. And I, I liked how the story had taken, I don't know, a little bit of trouble and turned it into a story. Um, and it felt good to be wowed like that, maybe wooed like that even by way of social media and hype. And of course, that reminded me of writers whose bodies of work have looked every which way at the set of circumstances or facts that surround a particular event or situation of their time. Um, and I especially love it when my undergraduate students discover these writers for the first time and then gush about them to me. It's so cool to just sit there like, okay, you know, tell me about James Baldwin. <laughs> it's so sweet. It's the sweetest thing. Um, so I, I have these, I mean, silly. I just like to put them up here. It's good. They're like, they're like, James Baldwin, yay. Uh, who else is in here? Joan Didion. Okay. Um, and so this brings me back to the student I mentioned at the beginning of the talk. Another thing he said in passing was that my book, Hemming the Water, was somewhat coded, or that he didn't have the code for it yet. I don't even know how we got on the topic of Hemming the Water in that conversation. He definitely brought it up. And I just thought that was intriguing, because um, it wasn't my intention to code it, or I don't know, I just never thought of it as coded. But I, sat, I also felt sort of like, pleased by that idea for some reason, and I, I'm not totally sure why. I'll have to unpack that some more, too. Um, but I like that somebody might explore the patterns of that book, and to maybe explore the context in which it was written, and one poem's relation to relationship to another poem. Um, you know, it was written over a long time, like 10 years in a lot of different voices and with a lot of literary and historical influences. And so just to have someone share that reading experience with me and then talk about like examining it and staying with it, I don't know. I just thought 
I don't, that's good for a writer to hear, I think. Um, in that book as well, that poem, The Antelope is Document, that poem is a nod to the French librarian, Suzanne Bray. And she has a scholarship around this idea that a document is evidence in support of a fact, which sounds really specific and really vague at the same time. Um, but it's also, it's my understanding that in addition to like pushing the boundaries of cataloging, classification, Britt was also interested in documenting her own life as she worked so that the world might have an understanding of her as a person and a person in context. Uh, I'm not really sure how I feel about that idea for myself. I think I could disappear and be all right. Uh, but I'm more excited, I think, about my writing in conversation with other writers and the idea that my writing couldn't be made without Baldwin or Amiri Baraka or Toy Derricotte or Audre Lorde. Um, so I, I'm just going to close with this last little story. So Audre Lorde wrote this really phenomenal talk. <laughs> And that she delivered at Medgar Evers College back in 1985. I am your sister, black women organizing across sexualities. And there's something I would love to see posted all over the place. Um, she begins her talk by saying whenever she comes to Medgar Evers College, it's like coming home to family. But then she says, and this is where the quote begins, as with all families, we sometimes find it difficult to deal constructively with the genuine differences between us and to recognize that unity does not require that we be identical to each other. Black women are not one great vat of homogenized chocolate, chocolate milk. We have many different faces and we do not have to become each other in order to work together. I really, I highly recommend this talk to any young feminist today. I have sent it to my daughter several <laughs> times. Um, and in it, she says, Lord says, I do not want to be tolerated or misnamed. I want to be recognized. And then she ends with, I am a black, I am a black lesbian and I am your sister. And I mean, there's a whole lot of really good juicy dynamite between the, stop, the start and the end of that talk. Um, and between all those parts, to me, are the words and influence that bring the reader to that point so that I am your sister is not like a slogan or a feel good moment. You know, there's, there's a lot of thorns and wellsprings before she gets to that spot in the talk. And um, to me, that's what like piecing together context and relationships is all about. So I think I will just end on Lord, end on that. All right. <laughs>